Club members. My name is Russ. And I'm Brett. And we are the winemakers here at Fellows Creek Winery. And I just want to point this out right away that we are winemakers. We're not actors or screenwriters or directors. We're way better at making wine than we are at making videos. <laughs> it's taken us a long time to make these videos for the Case Club packages. But you are our favorite customers, Case Club members. Uh, thank you for your support and your loyalty throughout all this especially. Um, and thank you for allowing us to shoot a few bottles of wine every quarter. Many of you purchased additional bottles with the 20% discount that you get at the time. So um, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so kind of like Russ said, we're not able to host our Case Club reception here um, where we physically pour you the wines and you know tell you about the wines and you can ask us questions and can chat. Uh, we're not able to do that, so instead we're doing videos where we're going to taste through the wines in your package and we're going to you know, tell you all about them uh, because the more, the more you know about your wines that you're drinking, the more you're going to appreciate them. You are watching this video because you are in the white package, so you should have gotten a Viognier. That's how you say it. Viognier. Yeah, look at how it's spelled. Well, that's how you say it. All right. A Soleimani White and a Frontenac Blanc. If you did not get these in your package, uh, call Angie. She'll fix it. She fixes everything. Yes, it's important before we start tasting these wines, all three of them need to be chilled. So if you have not done that, maybe go throw them in the refrigerator for at least an hour and then you can join us or just taste the wines after the video. All right, first up, we're going to talk about Viognier. So yeah, look at your bottle. It's spelled V-I-O-G-N-I-E-R because it's French. So real quick history on this. I'm going to show you this label content too. But Viognier originated in Croatia. It's cold. It's got condensation on here. Try to dry that off. But so it originated in Croatia, and then it uh, is more um, known in France, and France grows more of it than anybody else. Um, California's got quite a bit too, that's where we got it from. But anyway, so yep, Viognier, that's the grape name. So once again, this wine is named after its um, varietal uh, grape. <clears throat> and underneath the variety name is American. That is where the grapes came from. So it was in America. Uh, we can't put California on the bottle because we are not in California. So that's only for Californians. So we put American. If this were able to grow in Minnesota and we made it, we would put Minnesota right here instead. And we got the vintage 2019. That is the year that the grapes were grown. Not the year that the wine was bottled or uh, treated or made, that's the year that the grapes were grown. So that's very important because the growing season controls about 80 to 90% of a wine's quality. And, and that, that is determined by how much sunlight it got, uh, how hot it got, how cool it got, uh, how much rain they got, when the grapes were picked. And so that all plays a very important role in the characters of the wine. And so some years are cooler than others, some years are warmer than others. So vintage is very important. Um, that, so we always put the name on uh, the bottle whenever we can. Also, moving down here, we have some notes, uh, just uh, a couple descriptors of the wine that you should expect to taste uh, in the bottle. And uh, we've got the alcohol content. This is a little bit higher for a white wine. This is at 13%. The fill level are 750 milliliters in here. And then we've got these cool symbols on the back. This uh, stands for wind energy. The um, electricity that we buy, or the, the money that's used to buy our, our electricity goes towards uh, producing more wind energy. Uh, this wine is also gluten free and this means that it is vegan friendly. There were no animal products used in the making of this wine. Uh, and then we have our name. Uh, this is one that I look for a lot when I'm out buying wine. It's produced and bottled by. That means that the grapes were brought here to the winery and we from, crushed the grapes, fermented them and produced the wine and we also bottled it. Other um, phrases, words that you might see is just bottled by. That 
typically means that a winery bought wine on the bulk market for various reasons. And there's various reasons that there's bulk wine on the market. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad wine or that the quality is lower. It just means that the winery didn't have much control over the wine. They uh, just buy the wine maybe because they were short on something or maybe that's the way they they operate or some larger wineries will have multiple wineries under their brand name and so they grow grapes from at one winery and then they move them to another winery and bottle it and blend it um, there. But uh, my favorite that I look for the uh, the most is estate bottled. If it's estate bottled or estate produced or in most cases it'll say estate up here somewhere on the front label. That estate means that the grapes were grown on property and controlled by the vintner, the viticulturalist, and the winemaker to tailor those grapes to the style of wine that they're, they're making. And that usually um, produces the best quality wine that that variety can make. Uh, so um, I, I like to see estate bottled. Uh, it's just a personal preference. Uh, and uh, we just have the Surgeon General's warnings, barcode, stuff. So that's our label information. All right, let's give it a try. It's been waiting a long time for this. <laughs> take after take. All right, so <clears throat> let's grab a screw cap on this one. Uh, we use screw caps on wines that are meant to be drunk early and fresh. So this is kind of a more later. Um, Fuller bodied fruity wine that um, we didn't we didn't create with the idea of bottle aging. So we put a screw cap on it, it's perfect the way it is, drink it now. And screw cap is a perfect closure for that. Alright. <clears throat> so now with some wine in your glass. <clears throat> first thing you want to do is take a sniff. That's gonna give you the first kind of initial perception of that wine. And then you want to swirl it around, give it a good swirl. <clears throat> if, uh, if you're not too good at swirling your wine, you can put it on the table and that helps, it, helps you hold the, the glass a little more steady. You can get a good swirl going that way as well. Um, I've seen some people you know, try a little too hard and they end up wearing their wine. <laughs> to avoid that, you can just use the table. But, wow. So now after you give it a good swirl, that creates more surface area for the wine <clears throat> and allows more of those aromatic compounds to evaporate. And it's uh, that evaporation of the wine molecules that you know, give you the aroma. And so when you do that, you can pick up a little more delicate kind of floral notes. Uh, so I get a little bit of stone fruit. I get sort of a tangerine, mango aroma. Yeah. And now as we kind of throw these terms out, these words out, if you're not detecting that, that's perfectly fine. Everybody's going to taste and smell things differently uh, and taste aromas differently. No, you can't. Well, you can kind of taste aromas, never mind. That's a, that's a whole other discussion. But <laughs> you can, you know, what were we saying? It's all about perception, how you perception. personally perceive the aromas and the flavors, and everybody is different. Yeah, some people are more sensitive to different compounds uh, than other people, and everybody has their uh, highs and their lows. So you'd be more sensitive to something and obviously less sensitive to other things, and everybody's uh, um, got different levels of those. So, so the wine might smell just slightly different to, uh, to everybody. You know, and it's just all how it, Perceives to you, you know, you're the one that's got to drink it and like it. I mean, wine is the way it is. So whether you like it or not, that's up to you. All right, yeah. Now for uh, a sip. Now that for tasting the wine, there's a lot of acid alcohol in wine, much more than you know most other foods. So. First, you want to just take a little sip and kind of swish it around your mouth to coat your mouth with it so your mouth can acclimate to that. Otherwise, the first sip is always going to seem harsh. You know, and it's, you know, it happens all the time that whenever we're tasting wine, you know, it's, it's 
part of the job. It's like one of the only professions in the world where you're required to, well, I shouldn't say drink, but taste on the job. Because uh, the only way to know if you know what you're doing is making the wine better or not is to taste it. So, um, so whatever we do, you know, that first initial sip is always going to be more harsh than uh, what the wine truly is. So give your mouth a quick little rinse, and then take a, a larger sip, and then you want to take take that and hold it in your mouth for about a minute, and just notice how the flavors and the texture of the wine changes and how it uh, just increases in complexity. The thing I really like about this wine is the flavors, they're, they're very subtle flavors. It's not a very in-your-face type, uh, type of wine. So it's really easy to drink. Yeah, it was, it was kind of cool. When I first tasted it, it tasted exactly like it smelled. But then the longer I held it in my mouth, I got kind of like a spicy, minerally kind of flavor and texture that kind of like kind of sent a little zing in my mouth that kind of woke everything up. It was... I almost get like a cool. hint of a vanilla maybe. Yeah, I see we're coming right towards the end. And so now this wine is bone dry. There is absolutely no residual sugar in this one. So kind of pay some more attention to that, to that as you taste some of the others as we increase in um, sugar content. So in this case, tasting through three different whites, we always want to start from driest to sweetest. So the Viognier is going to be the driest of the three, uh, Frontenac Blanc is going to be the sweeter. None of these are desserts sweet, dessert wine sweet, uh, they just have a balanced amount of sugar. As winemakers, that's our whole job is to create the most uh, balanced and complex wines that we possibly can. That literally is our job. Now the Solmani. What the heck is that? Uh, Solmani is Nordic for sun and moon. Sol being the sun, Mani being the moon. The sun represents the warmer uh, region of California and the moon represents the more cooler climate here in Minnesota. And so what we've done is taking grapes from both regions and blended them together to get the soul money. Uh, the sun and the moon also represents the night and day differences between the two different kinds of grapes. Uh, the, uh, in this blend, it's Pinot Grigio and Frontenac Gris. It's the same blend as last year, uh, if you remember that one. Uh, we try to keep these consistent as possible. But the Pinot Grigio obviously comes from California. The Frontenac Gris comes from Minnesota. The Pinot Grigio is kind of a softer, more um, uh, lighter, delicate wine. The Frontenac Gris is, has real strong aromas and real fruity flavors and more acidity to, to give it that um, food-friendly pairing and soft, kind of fruity, uh, palatable wine. So we kind of get the best of both worlds in these uh, Solmani blends. So, um, yeah. that's all money. Let's give let's, it a try. That's what the name means. <clears throat> that was the idea behind this. Uh, this has also been very popular since we released it. All right, and this one too, it's got a screw cap on it. That means that it is ready to drink now. Keep it fresh and fruity. There we go again. I'm swirling the wine just because when I talk, I need something to do. I can't just sit still. <laughs> I always have to be doing something. All right, so first off, when you get the wine in your glass, don't swirl it. Give it a good, good sniff, just like we did with the Viognier. That's going to give you the initial impression of the wine. Remember that, and then give it a good swirl. And you should start to pull out a little more delicate flavors and profiles of the wine. That first. The first initial uh, rolling tastes a lot like apricots and peaches, kind of a mild peach with, I don't know what else to describe it, but just like a white wine character, white wine with apricots and peaches.
Yeah, I really get a lot of the really intense tropical fruit aromas from the Frontenac Gris when I smell this wine. Not the swirling, you get the, it's like the stone fruits have kind of toned down a little bit. You get a little more floral and almost a little citrus in there, kind of like a tangerine kind of citrus aroma. So you are very fruity, very citrusy, very intense, like just you can, uh, if you remember the Viognier, it's the whole intensity of the aroma is so much stronger than the Viognier. All right, now we go for a small sip to uh, rinse the mouth out. I'll close out. All right. So once again, take a larger sip, hold it in your mouth for a while. Notice all the changes, the flavors, the complexity of it. It's only slightly sweet. It has a really crisp acidity to it. And it has that mouth-watering appeal to it without tasting sharp or harsh. It's a really well-balanced wine. This is, right now, this is kind of topping my list of my favorite white wines. This one turned out very well. So enjoy. Right. Frontenac Block. Uh, I'm going to run by uh, a little bit of history uh, for you real quick on this one. As you notice, uh, Frontenac Blanc. It, it's similar to like the Frontenac Gris we were talking about over here, but it's still very different. So I'm just going to run a brief little history lesson uh, for you here. So the fr name Frontenac might sound familiar. You know, there's a town in southern Minnesota called Frontenac. There's a grape uh, that makes red wine called Frontenac. And then there's this Frontenac green we were talking about. But what makes this Frontenac Blanc versus the other ones? My ass is a premature. All right, so in 1978, the University of Minnesota released this grape that they hybridized <coughs> and named it Frontenac. And it's, you know, the, this is kind of what a vine looks like uh, when they're out there growing in the the vineyards. Uh, it's got these great clusters hanging on it. The Frontenac is all red. It's a really dark colored grape. And so when they first made this in 1978, all of these grapes were red, dark red, at full maturity and harvest. So then after a couple of years in the vineyard somewhere, the one of the vines mutated. Uh, don't get freaked out by the word mutation. It's just a change in the, the vine. And those changes occur from uh, lots of different things, uh, mostly environmental. So like just the sun beating down on this grapevine for a couple of years will create changes in the, the cells of the plant. And so in this case, probably somewhere in here, uh, this chunk of grapevine had mutated. And then as it kind of spread across the vine, it changed the pigmentation of the grapes. So. It, these uh, mutations can alter a lot of different things. Uh, the shape of the leaf, the size of the leaf, the time of ripening. Uh, sometimes they won't ch hardly change anything that's visible. There'll be, be such a minute, perceptible difference in the vine that's undetectable. And sometimes it changes the pigment in the grapes. And so instead of the grapes being fully pigmented and coming out red at harvest, they're kind of a grayish orange color because they have some, some pigmentation in them, but um, not a whole lot. So then you cut these sticks off, you propagate them, you plant vineyards of them in all over the, the countryside. And then these Gris grapes, you know, get mutated again, say by the sun, and then it produces you know, some shoots that have clusters with no pigmentation in them. And so these grapes we call blanc, you know, obviously meaning white. So they can, because they have no color uh, in them at all, not like uh, the green or the red. So that's a quick lesson on grape mutation. These things happen all the time, all over the world. That's why we have Pinot Noir, Pinot Grigio, and Pinot Blanc. Uh, and now we also have Pinot, uh, Frontenac Noir, Frontenac Gris, and Frontenac Blanc. <coughs>
So that's where the Frontenac Blanc comes from. The, it also changes the flavors a little bit as well. I typically see more tropical aromas and flavors in the Frontenac Blanc than we do in the Gris. So that's probably the biggest change. Otherwise, like uh, the chemistry and the style of wine that they produce is all very much the same. Just uh, some cool differences in the flavors of the grape uh, and the wine that it produces. So this one, being last on our list, I would consider this to be semi-sweet. The Solani would be considered semi-dry and the Viognier, of course, is uh, completely dry. Um, so just in the spectrum of sweetness, uh, that would be the scale and the level that these are at. <clears throat> there I go again, swirling my glass before I sniff it. I don't do everything wrong. <laughs> right, Brett? No. Not everything. <laughs> Alright, so, take a sniff. Get that uh, first impression. So, you know, we were saying that the Solmani was kind of the had more heavier Frontenac Gris aromas. Now this one definitely has uh, a much different aroma profile than this one did. And that's the difference between the Frontenac Blanc and the Frontenac Gris in both wines. You know, obviously this one's all Frontenac Blanc, but even this one, you know, just smells like I remember Frontenac Gris smelling like because the Frontenacs have such uh, intense aromas. And this one too, the Blanc is so powerfully aromatic. I get a lot of like uh, melon in the nose. Yeah. Maybe some citrus. Yeah, like a like a fresh pineapple. Not an overripe pineapple, but like a fresh, fresh cut. Maybe slightly underripe pineapple. And like some like maybe lemongrass. Like, kind of like if you were to put grass and lemon in the blender. Just the, the aroma of it makes my mouth water. Now we go for a little sip. Yeah, just right away I get, taste a lot of tropical flavors. Alright, I'll call that a minute. Again, it is slightly sweet but also very crisp and bright acidity in this wine. Very balanced. Uh, another well-rounded wine, great for sitting outside. Um, it would be great with food, cheeses and crackers. That's usually my go-to. Uh, hmm, what else? I don't know. I just, I can see, this is, this is always my staff favorite. I can see, uh, this is newly bottled as well. Uh, it hasn't been out all uh, for maybe a month or so. And I want to say, God, I can't remember what you do. Just, um, just shy of 5,000 bottles of this, so uh, we should have plenty to go around. So, enjoy. This concludes our wine tasting. Thanks for watching, and I hope you learned something or developed a greater appreciation for the wines that you uh, just had. And I uh, hope to see you in August at the next uh, Case Club reception. Yeah, once again, thank you for your loyalty and your membership. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.